All right. Hello, Peace Corner podcast listeners. Welcome especially to those of you joining us on Facebook Live and those of you joining us in podcast form for this first ever live taping of the Peace Corner podcast as we kick off a new season of the podcast focusing on localization and locally led peace building. I'm Xander Willoughby. I'm the program manager for Plus Peace. You can find us at pluspeace.org. And I'm beyond excited to be joined by two amazing peace builders. We're joined today by Shadi, a UNOY projects and fundraising officer and UNOAC Young Peace, Be- peace Builder Fellow, as well as Severin, an award-winning researcher and author on war and peace, and professor of political science specializing in international relations at Bernard College at Columbia University. Let's go ahead and jump right into it. Severin, can you tell us a bit about your journey as a peace builder started? This is embarrassing. I forgot to unmute myself. So let me tell you about my journey. Uh, I actually started as a humanitarian aid worker. I worked in Kosovo, in Congo, in Afghanistan with uh, Doctors Without Borders and Doctors of the World. And uh, I felt that it was very important work, uh, but I felt that it was like a never ending task uh, because uh, the causes of violence were still there. So I was addressing only the consequences and I decided I wanted to address the causes of violence rather than just the consequences. And also, as I was working, I, I got very uncomfortable with the, with the world of international aid uh, because of the inherent racism that there is in this world and because of all of the problems that uh, I document in my work. So I started researching and writing about the causes of violence in Congo, the best way to address them. And then I decided that I really wanted to focus my research on solutions. So I decided to focus on peace building and I decided to expand my analysis on two other conflicts beyond Congo. And uh, I got regularly invited to brief or to help people who work for the United Nations, for non-governmental organizations, for foreign affairs ministries, for foundations, etc. And so I got increasingly involved in the actual practice of peace building in addition to just doing the research. Thank you. And Shadi, I'm going to ask you the same question. Can you tell us a bit about where your journey as a peace builder started? Sure. So uh, my name is Shadi and uh, I worked in Iran in the beginning in my peace building career since 2016. Um, That was a very short time after the UN resolution um, 2250 was passed. So we were working on intercultural um, peace building with uh, with cultural exchange. So we had um, internationals coming to Iran and volunteering and uh, sending also Iranian young people abroad. And this was the start of, uh, of my experience as a peace builder because the image of my country is often really blackwashed in, in mainstream media. Um, in 2017, I was uh, selected to attend the Youth Peace and Security Consultation in uh, Bangkok for the Asia Pacific region. And that was where I formally started uh, engaging in what we know as the field of peace building. And uh, from there, uh, I've been to quite a number of countries for trainings, for fellowships, for initiatives. And um, the the thing that really inspires me is the power that young people have uh, in creating opportunities, in creating um, peaceful societies, cohesive societies, and also the resilience that they have. So in 2019, I did a research on uh, Tunisia and youth peace building in Tunisia, which was an amazing experience to be interviewing lots of young people there. And uh, currently I am hoping to pursue my PhD in the field of youth peace building to shed light on the amazing things that young people are doing. That's a little bit about me. Thank you both. I've been looking forward to this conversation for months as we've prepared for this. And it's such an honor to share the space with both of you today. Um, Back to Severin, you wrote a book called Peaceland. Can you tell us a bit what Peaceland is um, and how you came to the revelation to, to sort of name it Peaceland? Sure, I can. But first, I want to say that I've been looking forward to this conversation for months as well. So thank you so much for 
for having me and and thank you for Shadi, to Shadi for for joining us. It's it's really wonderful to have you all there. And thank you to anyone who's uh, joining us live on Facebook or or on podcast or whatever. Uh, thanks for listening. So to your question, Zender, uh, what is Peace Land? Well, Peace Land to me is the world of peace builders who spend their lives going from conflict zones to conflict zones. And Okay, I'm going to tell you two stories to tell you how I, I came to, to this idea that there was this specific world of international peace builder uh, and, and that this word was actually uh, quite weird and problematic and that we actually had to study it and to try to change it. So the first moment was uh, when I was in Congo, I was very young, I was like 22 something, 22, 23. Uh, and I was having lunch with my team from Doctors Without Borders. And at that time I was a typical aid worker who thought that there was nothing wrong with the current aid system. I absolutely loved everybody who was around me uh, and I admired my colleagues a lot. Uh, and then I was having lunch with my team. So only the expatriates, uh, there was uh, the uh, country director who was from Switzerland and the administrator from Spain and also uh, the uh, medical director from uh, Guatemala. And uh, everybody, all of them started uh, talking about our Congolese colleagues. And they started saying things that I found really shocking. Uh, they were saying, well, did you see what the, what the driver told me? And then the other one answers, oh, but they're so stupid, all of them, and you can't trust them, and they're always lying, and they're so lazy. And you know, going on and on during the entire lunch uh, and saying horrible things about our Congolese colleagues. And I was wondering, okay, these are people who are well-meaning because they've come to Congo, they've sacrificed a lot. Uh, the, one of them had actually sacrificed his marriage to be there. Uh, so they've come with the best of attention and, and yet they're saying terrible, terrible things and, and probably they're thinking terrible things about the people they work with, about Congolese people. And they started saying terrible things as well about everybody else, about uh, the people who are our beneficiaries, as we called them at the time, and local authorities, etc. So I said, okay, there is something really wrong with the aid system, with the current international peace building system and international aid system that transform people who are really well-meaning and who are good people that hurt into these kind of racist monsters. Um, and the second moment was uh, just a, a few weeks later, uh, I was... Uh, Meeting, uh, so I was representing Doctors Without Borders to a meeting with uh, European Union officials. Uh, the big boss uh, from the European Union office had come to Congo to visit what she called her NGOs, uh, meaning the, the non-governmental organizations that the European Union was financing. And given that we received a bit of money from them, I, I had to be present. Uh, and so she arrived and she was based in Brussels. Uh, she had spent a couple of days in Kinshasa and she arrived, uh, it was in 2003. She arrived in Goma where I was based and she started lecturing us for one hour. And she was saying, you know, I don't know what you're doing. Uh, all of you NGO people, uh, you think that you're in a, in a place of war, but actually the Congo is at peace. And my colleagues and I, everybody around me, were looking at her and like, what? Uh, and she continued, she was saying, well, the Congo is at peace and, and, and you have to realize that and you have to act as if you were in a peaceful country. And I was like, okay, yesterday and the week before and the months before my team and I, we had been working, I don't know, 18, 20 hours a day. We had been working nonstop because there was a massive emergency just, just next to Goma. Just a few kilometers away from Goma, there was uh, uh, one of the armed group that had attacked one of the big villages and there were more than 100,000 people who were displaced. There were a lot of people who had been killed, a lot of fighting, a lot of suffering. And so I had this European Union official coming right from Brussels telling me, oh, you don't understand anything. The Congo is at peace. I said, okay, what's your definition of peace? That's so weird. Uh, and I thought again, okay, it's not a problem. I realized afterwards, it's not a problem with her. 
her specifically. It's more a problem with the way we understand conflict, the way we understand peace, the way people decide that a Congo is at war or is at peace. And then the, the more I research this uh, weird international peace building system, this world of peace builders that I, that I call peace land, uh, the more I saw all of the issues with the standard peace building strategies, the everyday routines, the way we analyze conflict, and, and the more I realized how badly international efforts can back, backfire and how we can actually worsen the situation very regularly. So I, I want to follow up on that, but first I want to ask Shadi, sort of, Severin's laid out this idea of peace land, of the the international is moving from conflict zone to conflict zone. Um, have you have you seen this in your work? Where have you seen this in your work? Thanks, Andrew. That's a, that's a really great question um, to, to be asking me as a young person because uh, I've worked with uh, two UN agencies, the UN Information Center and uh, UNICEF, both in Iran and my, my home country for uh, internship assignments. And, and when you're an intern, you actually have this, this sort of neutral position in the organization because your personal um, stance is not really like at stake if you have a critical gaze towards things that are happening. And um, I, I've actually had several encounters with not only expatriate colleagues, but also sometimes with local colleagues who were... Um, pride of my daily, let's say, routine. And uh, I can actually point out to one of these uh, examples. Um, so uh, the information center's duty, essentially, any, any UN information center's duty is to, to provide information to, uh, to the nationals of that country and also to the broader um, audience. And for this to happen, you have to partner up with local people who are creating uh, meaningful change in that country. And every time we had a local NGO coming to the UN Information Center, um, our director who was Ukrainian had to have one of the staff interpret the meeting for her. And um, everyone of course presents themselves really nicely in, in the meeting and they have really promising um, agendas, really promising results. And whenever they left, there was always this internal discussion between her and the, the colleague who was interpreting on like, you know, can we trust these people? Can we, um, you know, can we go forward with these people? And I sometimes felt like this is not fair because whatever the interpreting colleague is telling this person, she or he is like listening to it. And she is not going out there into the society to fully, you know, deal with people and to fully understand which NGO is working and which NGO is not working so you can partner with them. And um, she'd been living in, in Iran for like a good solid five, six years and she barely knew how to speak Farsi. Um, and, and I still think among the people that I met, she was one of the, the smarter Peacelanders because she laid a lot of, not because she trusted me, but in general, because she laid a lot of trust in, um, in people who quickly managed to speak the language of Peaceland. And I'm really um, counting on, on Severin to describe this language a little bit more and, and to explain it and, and how it works. But um, there was also another example that I saw as an outsider. When I was researching in Tunisia, I was researching youth peace building initiatives and international organizations um, that provide funds or supports to these uh, initiatives. And uh, I also met this really lovely um, young French lady who was uh, working in the in one of the agencies in Tunis. And uh, I lived in Sousse, which was uh, about two, three hours away from Tunis. And I would go to Tunis to do my interviews because most civil society organizations were based in Tunis. And uh, sometimes in the evenings, I went to have like coffee with her. I, I speak French, so, you know, I, I think that was pretty helpful for her, even though half of Tunisia, technically, they also speak French. But uh, we would go to have coffee or tea together. And one night, um, there was this strike happening, like petrol strike. So there weren't many taxis. And I had to go back to my city at, at the like late evening hours. And uh, I was trying to hitch a cab for her to go back to her, her residency because she had been in Tunis for a couple of months and she was still being uh, moved around with the UN taxi, like the UN official driver. 
and she kept calling him and he wasn't answering and uh, i just told her look you can just take a cab it's on the side of the street it's a bit complex but we can call local companies you know we, we can get you home no worries and then i knew that i also have to get home to another city <laughs> and uh and just she just kept saying no no don't worry about me i'll find the un taxi i'll i'll, I'll wait for for him to come back and and at that point i i started realizing a little bit I mean, it started activating, getting activated in my head that it's not always um, it's not always easy to 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 be moving from all these countries. Uh, she, formerly, she worked in Senegal, um, and then trying to integrate in, into all of these countries, perhaps for someone. And, uh, and, and and on top of this, like this sort of barrier that I can only get, you know, from one place to another using the official UN taxi, whereas if that taxi just doesn't show up, you're standing on the side of the street, which is not really nice. I mean, I think it's probably safer um, if you go on your own transport. So these were uh, examples that I, as an insider in the UN agency and also as an outsider, having peers and friends in this field had seen. And, and uh, this really made me actually interested in Severin's research. So um, I, I, I finally saw that this is a legitimate concept that actually is materialized and it exists. And I'm not just imagining things or um, judging people or criticizing people uh, about certain behaviors. Thank you, Shadi. And Severin, you, in our previous conversation, you described yourself as a, a former peace lander. Um, could you map out for us your journey from starting out as an aid worker to where you are today as an award-winning peacebuilding author? Do you want me to tell you how my career, my career in international aid got started, for instance? Perfect. <laughs> okay. So uh, to me, that was the typical peace lander way. So when I was 23, I got my very first job out of graduate school as assistant country director for Doctors of the World, Médecins du Monde, in Kosovo. And to me, that's a typical experience because at the time I didn't speak Albanian, well, I still don't speak Albanian or Serbo-Croatian. Uh, at the time I had virtually no knowledge of Kosovo history, culture and politics. Uh, actually, I started reading my first book about Kosovo on the flight uh, to the Balkans. And I never finished the book because the flight was too short. I was coming from Paris, but I got the job because I spoke decent English and that was the vehicular language uh, in my mission. And also I had two fancy master's degrees, a good training in political analysis, and also some field experience in a variety of post-war places and developing countries. And so when I think about my performance at the time, uh, I think a lot about my Kosovo assistant at the time. He was named Nerim. My main job was to analyze the political and the security situation in Kosovo and to write reports for uh, my supervisors. But I didn't have the knowledge uh, that I needed for that, the background knowledge, the historical and, and, and political knowledge and society knowledge that I needed for that. It was Nerim who had that knowledge. Nerim had 20 years of experience investigating political issues. He had a tremendous knowledge of the Balkans, history, politics, and culture, and he had lived in Kosovo all his life. But I was the outsider, and so I was the one in charge. And the thing is that I had never managed anyone in my life before, so I had absolutely no idea how to deal with him. And eventually I found a way to keep him busy. So I asked him to compile, translate and summarize clippings from the local press. And I can still see him every morning. He would religiously post his work on our bulletin board and my colleagues would walk past and nobody would stop to read it. And even I often didn't have the time to read his work. And I thought, well, it was such a waste of time, energy, and talent. And I realized afterwards that that was not a stroke of good luck for me and, and bad luck for Nerim. That was a typical situation for foreign peace builders. And so that's why I consider myself a foreign peace lender. 
Most entrepreneurs, small peace lenders, uh, they assume that local people do not have what it takes to build peace, that they are incompetent, corrupt, violent, otherwise they wouldn't be at war. Uh, and in contrast, outsiders, foreign interveners, they believe that they have the required skills and expertise to build peace. And I show in my peace land book that this belief is largely rooted in the hierarchy of knowledge that exists in peace building. In the eyes of most interveners, what makes a good peace builder is education and work experience in specialized topics like gender or human rights or election organizations. Uh, and if possible, it's important to have worked in a variety of conflict zones. And in contrast, and you do have exceptions, but in general, the knowledge of country specialists is much, much led by, less valued and the knowledge of local people, it's generally trivialized. The result is that in virtually all aid and peace building organizations, foreigners like myself fill the management positions and local people make up the lower level staff. And the foreigners often don't speak the local languages and they often have no in-depth knowledge of local, local societies, cultures and institutions. And this always results in a number of absurd situations. And so some of them are really funny. Uh, I've been to coordination and management meetings uh, in which literally people couldn't understand each other because they didn't speak the same language. So the problem is that at other times, the consequences are very disastrous. Um, and you asked me to, to map out my journey. So again, I started to me in the late 90s, I was a typical aid worker, a typical peace lender who really didn't think that there might be anything wrong with the current aid system. And then during my doctoral research and the writing of my first book, The Trouble with the Congo, I realized the importance of local bottom-up causes of violence. And, and when I say local, I really mean at the level of the individual, the family, the clan, the municipality, the community, the district. So I saw the importance of local conflicts around land, around who's going to be the chief of the village, who's going to have the traditional power, who's going to have access to local resources. And I also realized that it's very, very rare that foreign interveners like myself or even national elite have the kind of in-depth knowledge of local conditions that we need to address these local conflicts. So that was the topic of the trouble with the Congo, my first book. And then for my second book, Peace Land, I really dug down into the problems with the, the current international peace building system. So as, as I've told you, I focused on, on the widespread uh, privacy, the really problematic focus on outsiders' knowledge uh, and the, the disregard for, for local knowledge. Uh, and I also focused on the importance of everyday routines and habits. Uh, I, I showed that everyday routines and habits perpetuate the problems with the current aid systems. And, and I'm really talking about practices seemingly mundane, such as who foreigners will socialize with after work, uh, how they ensure the security, like what Shadi was telling us, taking only specific taxis or staying only in specific parts of towns, uh, how they evaluate the success of their action. I mean, I have an entire book on that. And to me, my new book, The Front Lines of Peace, that's gonna be released in, I think, two months. Uh, the Front Lines of Peace is really the culmination of my journey. Uh, and this book is, to me, the most useful part of my work so far for, for policymakers and practitioners, because the front lines of peace switches the focus from failure to success. And it shows how we can actually build peace effectively. So both in conflict zones like Congo or Colombia, but also in ostensibly peaceful countries like the United States or France. And in the front lines of peace, I, I show how we can build peace based on success stories from all over the world. Thank you, Severin. And Shadi, I saw you smiling in the beginning of uh, Severin's story. It, it sounded like something resonated <laughs> with you and her story from Kosovo. Um, I wonder if you can share with us some of the barriers that you faced um, with Peaceland, entering Peaceland in the peace building system. Sure, um, I have a very short version and a very uh, long version. Um, 
of my answer. I don't know which one you want to hear first. Maybe the short version. Whichever feels right. <laughs> we'll the, short you. Version, the short version is my passport. Um, so I'm Iranian. And um, there's pretty much nothing you can do with that passport except go back to your home country, um, which is nice. I mean, I, I kind of miss it right now. We're in 2020 pandemic. I can't even go home. But uh, if, if I want to give you now the long version is, uh, it's it's mostly about um, what Severin was saying that that your knowledge, um, the fact that I speak multiple languages, I speak Arabic and I speak Farsi, and um, fortunately or unfortunately, they are the two languages widely spoken in many conflict zones. Um, and my knowledge of uh, of having visited and 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 lived in in a lot of these countries. Um, like they are completely disregarded because at the end of every application it's written, uh, this position is open only to people who have a European passport or are already a residency in that country. So I've been interviewing, uh, I graduated in September, I've been interviewing with a lot of organizations that are part of Peace Land as we now all agree to call them. And, uh, and, and they, they reach up to the contract point, they send me the contract and I'm pretty transparent with them about who I am. I mean, I submit my, you know how the UN applications work. They ask almost everything about you, like all your family history, whatever um, sort of information that they can. So I do put my passport, my immigration situation all in the beginning. And they interview me through different levels, written tests. And they send me the job offer and, and they ask for my documents and then they say, oh, we're sorry, we can't uh, have you. And this is this has happened three times in 2020 in a pandemic where people are struggling to get jobs. I've been getting offers and I've not been going because of, uh, of my nationality. And uh, back to what Severin was saying, maybe a colleague of mine or someone else in our sector who is uh, who has graduated from a prestigious university can simply take up this offer, even if they don't speak all these local languages or does not have um, enough uh, experience in that country. Why? Because they are not able to fill that position with me, so they need to fill it with someone else. And who else uh, would be a more suitable candidate than someone who can literally move there next week? Which, by the way, happened in my <laughs> interview with DRC. They asked me to come to Greece a week after they sent me the job offer. And I was like, this is not like a block away. You know, it's another country. It's, it's even if I was European, I would need some more time to, you know, sort my stuff, um, give notice to my apartment and, and things like that. So... I think the biggest barrier for, for a lot of us um, from countries that are, are known as Global South is the, the passports, that the UN just uh, prefers to choose the most convenient option to, uh, to send to countries where expertise is actually more important than your nationality or your knowledge. That is um, one of the biggest barriers. And then of course there are other barriers. Um, so Severin was saying a lot about how she had two prestigious masters and a lot of trainings in different countries, which is, I mean, this, this is just like screaming peace land because many of my colleagues, and by the way, these days, my conversations with my colleagues in our field are just depressing. We're just saying, yeah, there are no job offers and the ones that are uh, actually there require four to five years of experience. And none of us are rich enough to do four or five years of volunteering and interning um, in different corners of the world to, to be able to secure that, that position. So financially also, I, I guess, I don't have the luxury of doing too many free internships. I've served the UN twice for free before internships were paid. <laughs> I think I've really paid my due to, uh, to the field. And um, that's another barrier, I guess. The third barrier that I've faced is a cultural barrier because um, I work very locally. So I, my peace building efforts are mostly grassroots uh, in Iran and in, in other countries. I have been in direct contact with young people and uh, I know the context very well, but I don't know the dynamics between colleagues in, in a secretariat or, uh, or in an office. So how I, um, how I like carry myself, when do I do an intervention? When do I raise my hand and speak? All of these um, can be something 
like uh, in favor of you and also against you. And uh, and then you very quickly look around your colleagues and you see how oh, there are two, three people who actually know. It's like it's like a code of conduct. So you go to some countries, eye contact is more common in others. No, you have to keep like um, COVID or no COVID, you have to keep your distance um, far, far away. And you, you quickly register like, oh, these people already know. Um, how it fits. So I'm still, I would say I'm still learning the ropes of this, this sort of like cultural differences. And uh, it's unsurprising that many of those people who already know this cultural dif differences already have an internal position being open for them without the rest of the world really knowing that they're getting a promotion. So unless you are aware of who is doing what within an organization, you'll never know that they got promoted to another agency or to another level. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, th th there are a lot of more barriers. <laughs> I can give you a longer, longer version. But, uh, but yeah, these were some just really off the top of my head. And it's, it's a little bit uh, discouraging because I always compare a peace plan to other sectors because after all, it's a working sector. And I know that um, businesses actually hire people based on uh, certain competencies. And by, by businesses, I don't mean multi-million businesses, any technical company, uh, let's say hires engineers or um, IT software uh, companies, they hire people based on competencies because at the end of the year, it's competent people who bring them revenue, who bring them money. And our sector is exactly, you know, I would say the opposite. Um, they don't sponsor relocation very often. Um, they don't, really care if they didn't hire the best person for the position because there's always someone else to fill it. I mean, the DRC case for me was uh, a position that required three years of experience in non-formal education, mother tongue speaker of Farsi, and uh, well-educated in the sector of uh, migration and refugees, which is the title of my master's. It's inter-Mediterranean migration and mediation. So it was one of those situations where I checked every requirement off the list, which doesn't happen often. You always have like two or three that are missing and then you're like, okay, I'll still do this anyway. And, uh, and then you just hit closed doors and that position does not disappear because the need is there. You still need a cultural mediator to work with children. But literally after this, I've been thinking quite a number of nights every week, who is taking that position? Like how many mother tongue Farsi speakers with this profile are already based in Greece or in Europe? And if there are any, like, please connect me to them because I would like to expand my network <laughs> to know like what they're doing. But, uh, but yeah, these are some barriers, I guess. When, when it comes to the bottom line. Shadi, there's one phrase that you used. You said, um, I've paid my due to the field. Um, and that, that's something that I, I don't have a follow-up question for it, but that's something I, I want to sit with, um, especially in youth peace and security conversations of sort of what, what that looks like, those inputs versus outputs versus getting positions like that. Um, thank you so much for sharing um, sort of the personal barriers that, that you faced um, with Peaceland. Um, speaking of Peaceland, since we're, you know, the, those who uh, want to change the world have to name the world and Severin named it Peaceland. So, <laughs> so we're, we're using it for the conversation today. Um, six years after publishing that book, where you laid out the flaws of the peace building field, um, what, what's changed since then? What, where have we seen improvement? What still needs to change? mute of course again okay so um, i think shadi already told us the answer to, to that question not much has changed it's still the same everyday routines and practices that uh, i analyze in in the book i published six years ago in Tisland. Uh, we still focus on elite and capital cities and headquarters. And above all, we still value the outsider's knowledge at the expense of local knowledge. Uh, there is still, Shadi was, was saying it very well, there is still a bias toward knowledge from foreign experts, from outsiders, from national elites, etc. cetera. And, and also uh, we've discussed also that how all of the problematic practices that I document in my Thiesland book, they're still there in terms of social lives, in terms of security, in terms of evaluations, uh, in terms of uh, advertising of their efforts, uh, all of these everyday seemingly mundane decisions that have really, really huge impact on peace efforts. And to me, the main change since I published 
not even in the past six years, but I would say since I published my very first article on peace building, so that was 14 years ago, uh, we've had a recognition that local causes of violence matter, uh, which is important because uh, when I started my PhD research in the early 2000s, nobody cared about local causes of violence. And there were just a few people and a few academics who were saying, oh, it's really, really important to look at local bottom-up causes of violence. And also, there is a consensus that it's really important to support local peace efforts. Uh, and again, it's something that nobody was talking about in the early 2000s and now has become kind of consensual uh, in peace land. So that, that's the two main changes that I see. Thank you. And in our work, we often talk about the need, sort of maybe one of the, the shifts that we have seen is the amount of um, outward and external emphasis that we put on locally led peace building. Um, I wonder if you could reflect a little bit on the situation you found yourself in in 2010 in DRC um, and what, what locally led peace building really means and how it can actually be, be meaningful. Yes, certainly. So these days, you're right, we talk a lot about the need for peace building initiatives to be locally led. Uh, so everybody says, well, locally driven peace building is important. Uh, if you read many high level United Nations reports like the HIPPO reports or even the latest uh, US State Department report on state fragility, uh, it's, uh, you, you hear and you read about locally led peace building. It's really a buzzword these days. Uh, and when I say, oh, locally led peace building is important, uh, when <laughs> the few times I'm in in-person meetings, I mean, the last time a year ago I was in an in-person meeting, uh, everybody says like, yes, of course, it's, it's very important. Everybody knows and, and I feel that I'm saying a truism. But uh, to me, all of that remains way too much at the level of the discourse rather than in actual practice. That's something that I saw, you asked me about DRC, about Congo in 2010. Uh, that's something I saw there. That's something I analyzed in my Peaceland book that was published a few years later. And to me, again, that hasn't changed much until now. In practice, peace building programs are still very much outsider driven and elite driven. There is still a lot more money, time and efforts uh, that are devoted to national and international peace processes rather than to local peace building. And unfortunately, the COVID pandemic has even further reinforced that. Uh, local peace building programs, they're still way too often designed by outsiders, by foreigners, um, at times in the best case scenario by national elites, but I'm talking about people who are based in headquarters and in national capitals. Uh, it's still really uh, these outsiders who design projects and then local people or local NGOs are supposed to implement projects that have been designed from th for them. And as for ordinary citizens, when they're involved at all, they're involved even further down the line during uh, what we call sensitization. I, I hate this word. Uh, it means basically convincing people that a program is good for them. And when we have efforts to promote, to promote local ownership, uh, very often it actually means ownership by national elite or ownership by elite. Uh, and uh, it means engaging the same kind of local actors, what I call the usual suspects. So either the government and, and the leaders and the presidents, or when, uh, when in the best case scenario, it's gonna be local NGOs, chief of village, chief of police. So basically people who speak the language of the donor, either the actual language, speaking English or speaking sometimes French uh, in, in some cases or, or other, uh, other specific language or the specific lingo because you, you know how many acronyms we all use and how many weird terms and, and how we have, like everybody who works in the aid world, as, as Shadi was saying, you have to learn the rope and learning the rope means learning the language, the specific way you phrase things and when you say things, etc. Um, and, and the fact that we focus on these national elites, on these usual suspects, on uh, even on these local elites, but who, on people who speak the language of the donor and, and of, the, of the peace lenders, then that can actually further marginalize other local people and ordinary citizens. So in practice, today, like in 2010 in Congo and like 
you know, for a long time before that, local people are really, really rarely involved in the design and in the planning of international efforts. And the thing is that my colleagues, uh, academics and, and I, we, we really share part of the responsibility for this and for the lack of progress on the ground. So when you look at the research on peace building, there is an, a, an overwhelming focus on, success, on failure. Uh, there is very, very little research on success. Uh, and when you look at the research on international support to local peace building, uh, the focus on failure is, is, is really stunning. And so that doesn't give policymakers and practitioners and anybody who works in the aid world the kind of insight that they could use uh, and that they need to make local aid peace building a reality instead of just staying at the level of the discourse. And so that's why I wrote my, my new book, The Front Lines of Peace. It's so that we finally have a sense of what works, uh, given that I know we know very well what doesn't work. Uh, the Front Lines of Peace uh, is focused on successful cases. It's focused on what works in building peace during and after mass violence, because they are really great people. They are great organizations that are really trailblazer. Uh, they have really made local elite peace building a reality. They show how we can implement local ownership in practice. And all of us, uh, researchers, but also practitioners, policymakers, we can learn a lot from these people. And, and young people who want to work in peace building, I think can learn a lot from these people and, and really use them hopefully as role models. And concretely what that means is that uh, we can put local, local actors in the driver's seat. And, and so I know it sounds like a bumper car sticker slogan and, and that uh, you may wonder what that really means uh, and how we can actually implement this beautiful, beautiful idea. But I have a lot of stories in my Front Lines of Peace book. Uh, and I can tell you some of these stories now, but I think we don't have much time left because there are kind of long stories. So uh, you can also, the book will be released in two months. So you can read all of them in the book when it's released, but I'm happy to tell you stories if we have time. Your call. That's the, the perfect plug for the book. <laughs> there, there are two reasons that I'm really excited for the book. One that at Plus Peace where I work, our sort of mainline goal is to make the case for build, peace building and sort of tell those stories of success. Um, and I, I think we, we'd really miss out if we didn't hear at least one of the stories from the book as sort of a, a teaser before we rush out to read it um, in the new year. If you have sort of a, a shorter one that you're willing to share with us. Okay, you give me five minutes for a story? Perfect. Okay, fantastic. I'll tell you my favorite story from the book. Uh, so it's a story that takes place in Congo. And you know that Congo is uh, the stage of one of the deadliest conflicts since World War II. And it's a, thing, it's a story that starts in 2007. In 2007, there was a little boy who was named Lucas and he was kidnapped and he was forced to work for an armed group. By the way, Luca is not his real name. I'm using pseudonym to, to protect his confidentiality. So anyway, Luca was kidnapped, forced to work for an armed group, and he was so small, so tiny at the time that he could inv couldn't even hold a rifle. And so his commanders would take him and they would march him up front and they would use him as a human shield. And somehow, Lucas survived and after three years with the armed group, he was sent back home to his mother, uh, Justine. But Luca had a lot of trouble assimilating. Uh, he hated school. He was often hungry because Justine, his mother, didn't have much money. And he still believed what his commanders had drilled into him, that the only way to survive was to use violence. And so, Luca spent his childhood running away to try to join other militias. At that time, he was eight years old, and that was the only life that he knew. Meanwhile, in the United States, uh, there was a young Indian American woman in her 20s, early 20s. She was named Vijaya Tako, and she was working for various organizations focused on Congo. And Vijaya was growing very uncomfortable with the entire advocacy world because she saw that her colleagues used a traditional top-down approach to peace building and that they relied 
on outsider skills and expertise. So the typical Peaceland fashion that we've been, that we've discussed. And what Vijaya saw also, and that was even worse, is that many foreign activists actually ended up harming the very people they wanted to help. Most of them believed that violence in Congo was due to the illegal exploitation of minerals like gold and diamond. So they spent their time and their energy advocating for new laws on conflict minerals. But the problem is that the new legislations actually deprived vulnerable people of their livelihood. And so many of the young men who, who lost their job decided to join the armed group because they had no other way to survive. And so whenever Vichaya traveled to Congo, she started asking ordinary citizens what they believed would lead to peace. And eventually she decided to try something in the village where Justin and Luca were living. She partnered with local activists and she organized lengthy meetings and workshops so that the, decident, the residents of the village would have the opportunity to develop their own analysis of the conflict that they face and decide what the best responses would be. And so the villagers talked for several months and then they came up with a plan for how to build peace and prosperity in their community. And the first step of that plan was for Vijaya and her fellow activists to give out $40 each to a few village women, including Justine, who used the money to start small businesses like brick making factories and donut shops. And the businesses took off and soon the participants managed to repay the loans. And they didn't give the money back to Vijaya or to the activists, but they used the money they reimbursed to implement the plans that they had designed. So they installed taps for clean drinking water and they rebuilt the roof of the local school. Uh, they organized trainings for the teachers to learn how to curb ethnic tensions rather than fueling them. And eventually they went on to lobby the local chiefs, the provincial authorities and the neighboring units of the Congolese police and army. And they asked for protection and for better services. And all of these efforts led to really major changes in the lives of the villagers. So for instance, Luca, he now had three meals a day, he had shoes without holes, and he had role models who didn't use violence to survive and to gain power. And like Luca, all of the villagers were safer and they were healthier. And one day, Vitaya was talking with Justine and Justine kept using the word success to refer to the whole initiative. It was because Luca had turned 13 and for the first time in his life, he was speaking in the future tense. He had stopped trying to run away all the time and he was making plans, peaceful plans within his community. And as Justin said, Luca now wanted to hold a pencil instead of a gun. And if, you, if you've seen the cover of the From Science of Peace, my new book, you can see where the cover artist uh, got the idea for the cover because that's the story she had in mind when she designed the cover. And so going back to Vijaya, uh, she created the Resolve Network uh, and the Resolve Network has used this approach to help more than 7,000 people over the past 10 years. All of these people were individuals either at risk of being recruited by armed groups or actually for more than half of them, they were former combatants like Luca. And as you know, militias have formed and reformed in Congo over the past 10 years. The pressure to remobilize has been enormous, but not a single person participating in the resolve programs has started or gone back to fighting. And to me, this story is inspiring and, and it's also very telling because there are big differences between the way most peace building organizations work and what Vijaya did. Because to start Vijaya decided to build peace from the grassroots. She decided not to focus on elite and on leaders based in capital cities and headquarters. And even more importantly, Vijaya didn't come and impose her beliefs and that way she avoided doing more harm than good. And like so many people before her and unlike the standard in peace land, Vitaya was humble, she was respectful, and she put ordinary citizens in the driver's seat. And so my book, The Front Lines of Peace, my new book, 
suggest ways to emulate peace builders like Vitraya and Justin so that we can help individuals like Luca and so that we can actually make local related peace building a reality. And I have a lot of other stories and examples like that one. Thank you so much for sharing. And we, in our pre-interview, we promised the three of us that, um, or promised each other that we would end on sort of a, a hope and sort of a, a future. So we'll, we'll talk in the past, or uh, not the past tense, the future tense for the rest of um, our time together. And so Shadi, I want to turn to you. And you and I have both been in a lot of conversations in youth peace and security, talking about meaningful youth inclusion, about pushing the localized peace building efforts. Can you sort of describe what meaningful locally led peace building and local or and meaningful youth inclusion and peace building looks like to you? So this is the most uh, difficult in the question in this interview because I instantly feel the weight and the responsibility of responding on behalf of many of my colleagues who have been in contact with me over the past week as we promoted this episode. Colleagues from Libya, from uh, from India, from Syria, and, and uh, all around the world. Um, of course, I can't name the list, otherwise we'd run out of time. So um, I think that the beauty of the response to this question is there is no one locally led peace building initiative. And that is what makes it much more difficult for the people sitting in the secretariats and sending expats. Just because you spent five years in Afghanistan doesn't mean that you can do the same thing in Cyprus. And just because you did two years in Cyprus doesn't mean that now you are the magical resolution to all the problems in Congo. And that's why we have to have experts in the secretariats of countries rather than just country hopping expats. Um, but if I were to define a uh, disclaimer based on my own experience and uh, um, visions, what is meaningful locally led peace building initiatives, I think it's it, it all comes down to trust. It all comes down to to putting away um, the racist glasses of or, or the colonialist view of we know better than you. Uh, we trust only bigger organizations because they're uh, more accountable and and all that things that that uh, us young peace builders we've been dealing with. I mean, um, in Iran you can't get funds into the country because it's a sanctioned country, and and how are you expected to to do local initiatives uh, without receiving funds. So um, I think locally led peace buildings, in order for them to be meaningful, um, we really, really have to stop this us versus them discourse and uh, conversation that we have of, okay, there are some people who are us, and then there are, are some other young people who are them working in the field, or vice versa, as young people saying big uh, uh, INGOs and then the UN offices never listen to our work and uh, they don't really care what we're doing. So I think this reconciliation would be the first step. Um, if you right now open the UNV website, uh, unv.org, you see there are two youth assignments, one which is a national position in, in China and the other one which is an international position in Jordan. And, uh, and that's it, that's, that's all youth have from the UN right now in, in their, like in, in all transparency on their websites, minus the internships that are posted. And, and I know thousands and thousands of people who are applying. So uh, bridging this gap, bridging this, this sort of us versus them discourse is really the first step and trusting in what young people know and, and want for their future because common sense, right? Um, if, if I'm living in a context and I will be spending the rest 20, 30, 40, 50 years of my life in that context, I would be giving much more you know, attention and caring much more about the future of that context rather than an expatriate who's spending the next two years there. I've been born there, I've grown up there, I know the language, I know the context, and, and then this I can be substituted by so many other colleagues because the worst part is this sort of alienation that happens for, and, and has happened to many of my friends and colleagues. They start speaking the language of the donor. They start developing projects to, to get the donor's attentions. And literally, um, we always have this, this, this vicious circle that there is a, there's an open call, young people apply, they don't get the funds because they want to implement their, their locally led initiative. And, uh, and, and at, at, UNOI, uh, whenever we look at the participant uh, reviews every year, you see that every region somehow has this problem with resourcing. 
And uh, you, what do you do as a solution? You do capacity building programs on fundraising and on financial sustainability. And right after that, of course, people increase their skills and they go back to the, to the let's say, arena of, of competing with huge INGOs and they still don't get the funds. Because what does it matter if you have all the skills and the, all the abilities and your NGO still has not ever received, uh, I don't know, a, a $100,000 fund? How is the donor going to trust you? It's a, it's, a, it's a vicious circle pattern. And we, we put, you know, the band-aid of capacity building on it. And the young people are not able, like young people are not um, talented enough. They don't have enough um, education. And, and we somehow assume that with capacity building programs, everything is going to change while we need to change structural frameworks. And, and I would say um, the, the, let's say the point that I want to bring this, <laughs> bring to this, uh, this question here is a personal experience that I had in, um, in 2017, when I went to the consultation in Thailand and, and I met some really amazing young peace builders who were super active in their field. And then we came back and, uh, we provided a report to the UN and thanked them for sending us with their money to a really fancy hotel, um, you know, it was a really nice vacation and also a very informative mission. And we asked them, okay, how can we now start the 2250 agenda in Iran? And then they said, youth and peace building is not in our priority. And I was like, what? Why did you send me if it's not your priority? <laughs> like, it, was, uh, it was a moment of like existential crisis for me and my colleague also. She is also super motivated, amazing peace builder. And, uh, and, and we ended up having to implement the project that we want on our own. We partnered with local universities. We invited colleagues um, through a self-funded, participant-funded process. And, and we did that event. And when I applied for my first UN internship and that was on my CV, the, the UN Information Center was like, oh, okay, she knows some, some things. She has implemented some projects. We can have her as an intern. And this, this sort of divide that exists between institutions and young people, if we don't remove this, if, if an institution is not going to trust young, a young person, how are they going to be able to, to lead um, locally meaningful initiatives? Um, in, in Severin's example, if there was not the, the trust that her colleague had put into that village, then the things would just continue like two parallel uh, roads. It's, it's like a marriage. If you're not willing to interact with your partner, it's just not a marriage anymore. It's no longer a partnership. And I think um, the first steps that are that are due are big reforms, real, real big reforms in, in the sector. It doesn't have to be overwhelming. It can start um, one at a time, like one day at a time. For instance, I see a lot of uh, JPO positions from Finland and Sweden and uh, um, the Scandinavian countries. And these uh, junior positions are obviously all ending up in, in Africa. Um, and this is just a reproduction of peace land. Like where else could that money go and how else could that money be more meaningful? Could you be subgranting locally led initiatives rather than spending this money? Um, could you be um, monitoring and evaluating these projects so you can have a trust building process to actually see the two year, five year, 10 year impact that young people are having, even if it's not um, an impact of let's say, uh, millions and millions of, of people being reached. Like you really got to put things into context to see how young people are already performing and then to support them and to guide them um, with whatever they're asking for uh, without the sort of like colonial discourse as to, well, neo-colonial or neoliberal discourse of like, yeah, we, we you know, we, we teach you, we guide you, we give you the funds, go out there and implement. And it's, it's, it's a little bit um, embarrassing to say, I've been part of many of these processes. I've been in many conferences where I've seen many friends reappearing on these panels on and on because somehow they started uh, speaking this language of the peace land. But um, unless we kind of agree that we have to trust each other, I don't think that um, locally led um, peaceful uh, initiatives or locally led peace building work um, I, I, I think we would have a long, long way to go. And the stake here is not profit. It's not um, money. Actually, the stake here is human lives and it's, um, it's peace buildings. I'm sure many of us were touched with uh, Severin's story of this young boy as if we knew him all of our lives. Um, but 
when we look at the bigger picture, these stories are often lost and numbers exist. X number of people died in this and that. And I think everyone uh, is their mission, ha has it on their mission when they enter this field to create a change that is meaningful and impactful for um, all of us, not just for a certain group. Thank you, Shadi. There, there's this through line of trust that's been throughout our, our entire conversation today, and I really appreciate you naming that. And that's a theme that we'll be touching on in the rest of the season for this season of the Peace Corner podcast. Um, I want to give a huge thank you to Shadi and Severin for joining us today for all the preparation that they put into uh, bringing this conversation to us, for giving us your time, your experiences, your expertise, your stories, all of that. It's been a, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you so much. It's been a great pleasure and uh, a big honor. All right. Thank you again to both of you. And for those of you watching on Facebook Live, we hope that you'll join us uh, in the rest of the season of the Peace Corner podcast to read Severin's book when it comes out and to follow both of these amazing peace builders through their careers. Thank you. Thank you.